Good afternoon. On behalf of Calgary Public Library, I would like to welcome you to today's presentation, the Chair of Christian Thought, Level Lecture in Christian Ethics, an afternoon with Dr. Warren Kinghorn. The, this program is presented in partnership with the Department of Classics and Religion at the University of Calgary. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge Mokinsis, the land where the Elbow and Bow Rivers meet. In the spirit of truth and reconciliation, we recognize the ancestral territories, cultures, and oral practices of the Blackfoot people, the Iahe Nakoda Nation, the Beaver people of the Sutina Nation, and the Metis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Calgary Public Library serves the community on this traditional land, and we honor all people who share, celebrate, and steward the Treated Seven Territory of Southern Alberta. During the program, if you have any question for our guest, uh, please send them through the chat and we will read them out after the presentation. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Carolyn Music. Since July last year, Carolyn Music holds the Chair of Christian Thought in the Department of Classics and Religion, University of Calgary. The holder of the Chair of Christian Thought engages in knowledge translation and initiates and organizes community events. Among these activities are four annual endowed public lectures that the Chair of Christian Thought organizes. The four are the Label Lecture in Christian Ethics, the Bental Lecture on Education and Theology, the Swanson Lecture on Christian Spirituality and Theology, and the Iwasa Lecture on Ur Urban Theology. These lectures demonstrate the breadth and depth of Christian culture and reflect how numerous disciplines intersect with the study of religion. The Department of Classics and Religion and the Calgary Public Library have teamed up in partnership with the aim of making the endowed Chair of Christian Thought public lectures accessible to a wide audience across not only Calgary, but the whole of Alberta. Caroline. Thank you so much, Saritza, and thank you to the Calgary Public Library for uh, facilitating our ongoing partnership uh, with the Department of Classics and Religion. And thank you, Steve, as well, both of you for your um, Zoom hosting today. Um, before I introduce this year's level uh, presenter of uh, Christian ethics, uh, I would first like to um, say a few words about Louis Labelle, who is uh, the person that the uh, lecture is named after. J. Louis Labelle was the third chancellor of the University of Calgary from 1978 to 1982. In fall of 1979, he joined with Dr. Peter Craigie in undertaking the planning and fundraising initiatives that in 1985 would result in launching the Chair of Christian Thought um, uh, activities. A graduate of Laval, the University of Alberta, and the Harvard School of Business Administration, this Quebec native had been involved in the petroleum industry since the 1950s. Labelle was active in many community services, including the United Appeal, the Vanier Institute, Boy Scouts, and the Société Franco-Canadienne du Calgary. He served on the University of Calgary Senate from 1974 until he became Chancellor in 1978. In 1985, the university recognized his contributions to society by granting him an honorary doctorate. The Chair of Christian Thought is pleased to host an annual lecture in honor of J. Louis Labelle. Now I would like to introduce this year's presenter of the Chair of Christian Thought Labelle Lecture in Christian Ethics. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Warren Kinghorn, who is Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Duke University Medical Center. He is also the Esther Cauliflower Associate Professor of the Practice of Pastoral and Moral Theology at Duke Divinity School. He is co-director of the Theology, Medicine and Culture Initiative at Duke Divinity School. And he is also a staff psychiatrist at the Durham Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina, where he's speaking from today. His current 
teaching and scholarship centers on the way the Christian faith communities engage questions of mental health and mental illness. He has also written on the moral dimensions of combat trauma, on the philosophy of psychiatric diagnosis, and on the role of the therapeutic alliance in psychiatric medication prescribing. He is co-author of the recently published Prescribing Together, a relational guide to psychopharmacology, which has been published by the American Psychiatric Association in 2021, a very recent uh, publication. Dr. Kinghorn, welcome to Calgary. Thank you very much for presenting this year's LaBelle Lecture in Christian Ethics. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Music. I'm really honored to be with all of you today. Uh, thank you for taking time out of what I take as a nice but uh, perhaps seasonably cool day in Calgary. And it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you here on a, on a Saturday in December. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, uh, Dr. Music, to all of the organizers, both at the University of Calgary and also at Calgary Public Grant Library, who've made this possible. I'm honored to be presenting this year's LaBelle Lecture. Uh, I also bring you greetings from uh, Duke Divinity School, and I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, where I co-direct the Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative at Duke Divinity School. We're a United Methodist Seminary in the U.S., uh, though representing a, a large uh, range of Christian traditions. And in the Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative, we uh, work to bridge the world of healthcare with the world of Christian faith and practice. And so it's really an honor to be here with you today presenting a lecture in Christian ethics as it relates to mental health. I do want to say today that I'll be speaking today as a Christian uh, theological ethicist as well as a psychiatrist, um, and uh, I think that uh, is uh, something I'm really honored to be able to do. Uh, Calgary, as uh, many cities in Canada and the U.S., is quite religiously diverse, and so uh, I would presume that this audience and certainly uh, the community is uh, has a very pluralistic religious um, uh, sense. And uh, I'll be speaking today as a Christian, specifically as a Protestant Christian who is influenced by the Reformed and Catholic traditions. But the way I'm going to approach this today through the lens of particularity, through a specific tradition, I think is also done well in other traditions. And so I think that uh, I've learned a lot, for example, from uh, Ron, Dr. Rania Awad at Stanford University, who has done a really significant work in Islamic psychology, uh, thinking about mental health uh, in uh, Muslim context, as well as Dr. Farha Abbasi. I know that uh, Calgary has a large Muslim population, and so I want to encourage um, not only exploration within my own tradition, but also thinking about how might, for those of you from different traditions, you might think about how what I say today might apply uh, outside of a specific Christian context. My, the title of my talk today is uh, Why Mental Disorders Are Not Brain Disorders Alone, A Holistic Christian Approach to Mental Health Care. And I think it, the first thing I want to say and want to emphasize is that mental illness, mental health challenges, and I'll use those terms uh, uh, interchangeably in this talk, are a pervasive and ever-present part of every community, including those of us gathered right here this afternoon on this Zoom call and our families and our loved ones and we ourselves. I, and I'm going to be showing some statistics in a minute. I'm going to be speaking uh, in some theoretical ways about the way that we understand mental illness and speak about mental illness. But I think the things that I would want to, to be takeaways before anything else uh, are the three uh, phrases on this sign, actually, on this image. Don't give up. You're not alone, you matter. If you're living through mental health challenges now, there's help for you and there's ways to get help and ways to think about support. And so I hope that everything in this lecture is, serves that end for, for those of you who are currently struggling or who are, who are uh, walking with and living with loved ones who are struggling. Uh, we do know that, to turn to a few statistics, that mental health challenges are a very significant uh, problem in the US and in Canada. Uh, this is U.S. data showing that in 2017, uh, over the course of a year, 7.1% of Americans uh, experienced a major depressive episode, and uh, these numbers are roughly the same in Canada. Uh, a, a bit more women than men, uh, younger among younger, uh, more among younger uh, adults than among older adults. Uh, but you can see here that uh, this means about one in 13 or so uh, U.S. citizens is depressed in any given year. Uh, this is a slightly older data that shows that um, in the United States with a population of about 320 million in, uh, in uh, 
in any given year, about 16 to 20 million people are living with a substance use problem. And if you think about any mental illness as defined by uh, our federal government using DSM criteria, uh, in any given year, about one in five Americans will experience some form of mental health challenges. And this is also, these numbers are very similar if you look at, at Canadian data. Uh, because this is in, partly, in part sponsored by the University of Calgary and because I teach and work in a university context and work with undergraduates and graduate students, in the US there's a biannual survey of uh, uh, universities and colleges of different sizes that asks questions about student health parameters. And one of the things that's very interesting, they asked the same questions from 2009 to 2019 when they changed the survey instrument. And there's a few things that uh, are notable about college student mental health. Uh, and it's that over the course of this decade, uh, students reported more and more and more psychological distress. So on an item, have you ever felt overwhelming anxiety? Uh, that went from about, you know, about around 45% uh, of students in 2009 to approximately 65%, 66% in 2019, with more women than men in saying yes to this question over the last 12 months. These are huge numbers. Uh, if, you, if students are asked, have you ever felt so depressed that it was difficult to function? In 2019, 48% of women on US college campuses answered yes to that question over the last 12 months, 37% of men. And you can see that these numbers have been trending up over the last 10 years. And this is all before the COVID pandemic. Uh, this is perhaps one of the most alarming to me. On the question, have you ever seriously considered suicide? Whereas in 2009 to 2011, 6%, which is still a fairly high number of US college students was saying yes to this question over the last 12 months. By 2019, these numbers were consistently trending upward to 12%. So about a doubling in the rates of students that endorsed having seriously considered suicide. And of course, all of this, all these data that I showed came before the COVID pandemic, which has just exacerbated mental health challenges uh, across our cultures. Uh, fortunately, for various reasons, that the rate of death by suicide in the US and in Canada decreased in 2020 compared to 2019. That's a positive thing that may or may not be directly related to the pandemic. But when people are asked about rates of stress, rates of depression, rates of anxiety, those numbers have gone significantly up in both the US and Canada in the context of the pandemic. And of course, in 2020 and 2021, uh, the pandemic is not the only way in which our societies seem stretched. Here in the US, of course, uh, in 2020 especially, and extending into 2021, there's been a really a nationwide struggling and reckoning and struggle and counter-struggle around uh, racial equity uh, that has centered around the, the killings of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery. And the fact that in the US, this was happening at the same time as the pandemic, at the same time as a particularly contentious election has left, I think, US culture feeling pretty strained. And that shows up in, uh, in markers of mental health challenge. And in Canada, you can see that, and in, and in the US, uh, the, the health effects of COVID are, uh, are significantly disparate. And so these questions of racial justice, racial equity, and uh, the pandemic are not unrelated to each other. They intersect. Uh, in the US, we've seen that COVID death rates, especially early in the pandemic, but continuing now, have been vastly disproportionately borne by communities of color. Uh, and you see here, this is from Statistics Canada, that um, this is a, a, a report that showed that in uh, neighborhoods in Canada where there were greater than 25% what the statisticians call visible minorities, uh, that there was a higher uh, COVID death rate, escalating according to the um, percentage of minorities in any given neighborhood. And so this, is, uh, this just shows that in Canada and in the US, uh, the pandemic is stressful for everybody, but the effects have been disproportionately borne by uh, racial ethnic minorities, by communities of color. And uh, that is something that absolutely affects mental health in all of our communities. Uh, and also there's the ongoing challenge and problem of suicide. Uh, rates of death by suicide in the US were increasing by about 20 years until plateauing, hopefully, and beginning to decrease from 2019 to 2020 but still uh, just under 50,000 Americans die by suicide each year. 
I think around 4,500 Canadians died by suicide last year. And, um, and I just wanna to pause to say that if you are currently struggling and if, uh, you're, uh, if you have any concerns for your safety or are thinking at all about suicide or that your life is not worth living, the most important thing you can do today is to get help. Uh, this is uh, a national um, uh, resource that's available in Canada. We have a similar uh, hotline available in the United States. And of course, there's local resources as well. But I want to make sure that everybody understands that uh, the most important thing to do if you're struggling is to get the help that you need and that you deserve. How do we talk as communities and in our culture about mental health challenges, about mental illness? In the last several decades, it's become common, both for mental health researchers and also for mental health advocates, those who really are working for equity and justice for people who live with mental illness, to uh, refer to and to frame mental illness as primarily a problem of the brain or of neurobiology, to consider mental disorders as brain disorders. Uh, this is showing up less explicitly than it did several years ago. Uh, some of the U.S. organizations have backed off this language a little bit, but you still see this prominently in prominent mental health leaders in the United States, such as Tom Insull. Um, and uh, I just, just was trying to see what advocacy organizations in Canada were saying. And, and this uh, particular organization, the Canadian Alliance for Mental Illness and Mental Health, doesn't directly state that mental illness is a brain disorder, but right on their webpage, you see that the, the first image is that a schematic image of a brain. This idea that, uh, that it's good, perhaps destigmatizing, to associate mental illness, mental health problems with problems of the brain. Uh, now, I'm going to talk on both grounds as a practicing psychiatrist and also as a Christian. Uh, I'll be taking issue with this position that mental health challenges should be thought of as only a problem with the brain or that mental health problems can never be reduced to brain processes. Uh, as if we could understand mental illness uh, by looking at the brain alone. Uh, but I do want to be very clear as a psychiatrist and as a Christian that mental illness does happen in the brain and in the body because our lives happen in the brain and in the body. We are biological organisms. And so that uh, means that sometimes indeed mental health problems can be understood as problems of the brain. When the brain isn't working right, it does show up in our mental health and can show up as discrete forms of mental illness. Uh, and, and, and so it's, it's, not, it's not impossible, it sometimes is right, sometimes most fitting to see mental illness as a specific kind of brain problem. But I wanna argue that it's a mistake to focus on the brain as the primary cause and site of all mental health challenges. If we wanna understand mental health in broader context in ways that mental health treatment can be most effective, we must take a broader view. So in the talk that comes, I wanna offer just, you know, for those that like lists, I'm gonna offer a lot of lists to, 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 um, for us to consider. I wanna first, in a kind of theoretical way, name four problems that I see with neurobiological reductionism. And these are different types of problems. Some are more theoretical problems, some are more practical or pragmatic problems, uh, but I'm gonna list four. I then want to go through five problematic ways of approaching mental health that often accompany reductionist assumptions. Then I wanna turn in a more specifically theological key to four Christian affirmations about being human. What does it mean to be human in Christian context? And then I wanna offer a few broad thoughts about what it might mean to move toward a whole person model of mental health care that affirms these affirmations. And then I look forward to being in conversation with you all. So first of all, four problems with neurobiological reductionism. Uh, why might it be wrong or in a, inadequate at least to see mental health challenges as lodged only in the brain or even in some cases primarily in the brain? The first is less of a theoretical problem than a practical problem, and that's what I might call the scientific progress problem. Uh, for most of really the last 150 years of its existence, but certainly uh, since the publication of the third edition of psychiatry's major diagnostic manual, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM, uh, since the publication of its third edition in 1980, 
uh, psychiatry has been working very hard to organize itself to develop um, ground up biological accounts of uh, especially severe and persistent mental illness, but of mental illness as a whole. Uh, psychiatry has, as a field, and I speak as an American psychiatrist, has assumed that to the extent that we can ground our diagnoses and ground our work in neuroscience, that will help us to have credibility within the field of medicine and also provide practical uh, modes of therapy to help our patients. Uh, and so beginning especially in the 1980s with the publication of DSM-3, uh, there was a lot of optimism that now that psychiatry had standard diagnoses, diagnoses that are still with us like major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, then basic science researchers and translational science researchers could uh, then do the work to fill in the gaps to build ground up uh, neurobiological accounts of mental illness. Uh, and you saw this in uh, books like uh, Nancy Andreasen, very prominent psychiatrist book in, in 1984 that was titled The Broken Brain as an Image for Mental Illness. You saw this in the US through the, the declaration of the 1990s as the decade of the brain and huge increases in funding for uh, basic, basic neuroscience research that was focused on mental disorders. And the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States, which is the primary funding agency for mental health research, has uh, for the last really 20 years de dedicated the vast majority of its resources toward neuroscientific research on mental illness, not on things like social um, uh, uh, research into social causation of mental illness or communities, uh, mental health or other things, although that's still a, 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 a much less of a pronoun priority. Uh, but unfortunately, all of this tremendous number of resources that have been poured into finding neurobiological accounts of mental illness have really not panned out. We're now over 40 years after the publication of DSM-3, and we have a lot more information. There's a lot of, of things that are known about how the brain works and how different brain circuits work, but there's, there's not a single major mental illness that we can now say we now have a clear uh, neurobiological account of exactly how this illness forms, exactly uh, what its pathogenesis is, and exactly how it can be treated. Uh, so we have a lot of information, but not a lot of direct explanation. There's various reasons for this. This is not necessarily the scientist's fault. It may be that because the, the, the way of organizing diagnoses that the DSM does is just way too broad. It doesn't uh, open itself to the kinds of questions that would lead to these kinds of explanations. But I would, I'm gonna suggest there's some other issues as well. There's a book on this that was published by the Harvard historian of psychiatrist Anne Harrington called Mind Fixers, Psychiatry's Troubled Search for the Biology of Mental Illness. And she, she narrates this and, and what the challenges are. She actually has a very sympathetic approach to uh, those who would seek these biological explanations. And her one of her uh, suggestions at the end is that psychiatry narrow its scope and focus not broadly on, on all kinds of anxiety and depression, for example, but really focus more on uh, severe, more severe, more clearly neurological forms of mental illness. I think that that's the wrong approach, but that's one that she would would propose. But but just to say, there's been problems in actually uh, uh, finding the answers that psychiatry is looking for. And I think this is related to a second problem that's more conceptual, which I would consider the field problem. Uh, this is a very familiar uh, figure ground image that uh, it, all, all of us have seen images of before. If we were in a room together, I would ask you to raise your hands. Like, what do you see when you look at this image? I know that when I look at this, uh, if I look at it one way, I can see two faces looking at each other. If I look at it another way, I can see a vase. For me, and I realize some people's brains are wired differently than mine is, but for me, I can see the vase or I can see faces, but I can't see both at the same time. It's very hard. It, it, my brain just works in such a way that one, when one comes to the forefront, the other recedes to the ground. I think that the way that we understand mental health challenges has a similar problem to it. And I might consider this not the distinction between the vase and the faces, but the distinction between what I might consider an inside out and an outside in approach to mental health challenges. The inside out approach is one that I've been trained in as a psychiatrist, and that I think is often the way that we talk about mental health in our culture, which is that mental disorders are problems of the brain or problems inside the individual. They're like personal individual problems, problems of the interior self that show up then outside in 
relationship and in community and in culture. So someone might say of a college student, for example, it's hard for her to function in class because she's depressed. The problem starts on the inside and then it shows up on the outside. And sometimes that can be a fitting way to talk about mental health challenges. But a different way, an alternative way, would be to take more of an outside-in approach where mental disorders are not problems on the inside that show up on the outside, but they're problems of relationship and of community and of culture that begin outside the individual or in a broader context, and then they show up in the brain, they show up in the body, in the internal experience of the individual. And so uh, one might say then of the college student, it's, it's hard for her to function in class and she's depressed because the class isn't being run in a way that she's able to participate and to flourish, or because this uh, university campus is fundamentally not hospitable to her and what she has to bring. Uh, and the question here is always of what's the best fit? Sometimes the inside out model works better, sometimes the outside in model works better, but um, I think it's helpful to ask both questions. And when the outside in model fits best, when mental health challenges are best understood as problems of community and culture and relationship and things outside that then show up in the life of the individual, then it's not helpful then to uh, somehow pin the problem on the brain or on anything related to the body. To use a kind of uh, crude image that's more mechanistic than I would want to use for the body, it's kind of like uh, blaming a radio for playing objectionable music. The radio is just doing its job. What it's doing is it's picking up signals that are coming in from the outside, relaying those signals. And uh, the, the, the thing to focus on is not the radio, but it's the station that's broadcasting the signals. The third problem I would argue with reductionism, with the idea that mental health challenges are just brain problems, is what we might consider the caseness problem. This is a technical word from philosophical work around psychiatric diagnosis. And the question is, like, what does it take to actually recognize something as a mental illness or mental disorder as a diagnosis? And one of the benefits of understanding mental disorders as brain disorders is that, in the, in the views of those who use it, is that then maybe mental health problems are not going to be stigmatized, that they don't any longer involve judgments about value or about um, you know, making a judgment on the way that somebody is living their life or anything. It, they can be just straightforward medical diagnoses like anything else, like diabetes or broken arm. Um, but this is challenging when it comes to mental health. And, and I think it, it, it's much harder to think about that philosophically. Most philosophers who consider this agree that it really isn't possible to eradicate judgments about value from psychiatric diagnosis. In certain other areas of medicine, this may be more possible. I, I have doubts about whether it's ever completely possible, but it may be more possible. So if I, instead of my being a psychiatrist, were a nephrologist, a kidney doctor, then I can see when the kidneys aren't working well because toxins begin to accumulate in the blood. Uh, if I were a cardiologist, I can see that the heart is not pumping well because fluids beginning to build up in the lungs, for example, when somebody's developing congestive heart failure. It's, it's more easily for me to see how the, the, the heart is an organ or the kidneys is an organ um, function within the health of the body as a whole. Uh, in some cases, we can see that with the brain, but in the cases of those conditions that get labeled mental health problems or mental illness, uh, it's, it's very hard then to know if the brain is working apart from make, understanding if someone's life is going well. So we know that the heart's working because it's pumping blood and uh, fluid isn't accumulating. We know that the brain is working insofar as someone is able to live and act in the world effectively and uh, in a way that isn't associated with lots of suffering. But what that does is it requires then a judgment to be made by the person who's affected and also by others about uh, is their life going well? And those are fundamentally ethical judgments, they're moral judgments. And so even if we did have ground up neurobiological accounts of mental illness, at some point someone would still have to say, this state of affairs of the brain that we're seeing is a disorder not because of what we see in the brain, but because it results in a way of living that isn't the way that people want to live or isn't appropriate or isn't uh, healthy. And those are, those are fundamentally moral ethical judgments. So I don't think you can ever actually 
take psychiatry completely away from the realm of values, which just means we have to be very transparent about what those values are and about how power operates in the work that we do. And the last problem that I would name is what I would call the stigma problem. Uh, and this is, I think, not a problem in all ways, but it's, uh, but it's something to think about. Probably the major reason why advocacy organizations push for biological explanations or accounts of mental illness is, as I said before, because the idea is that if we can just associate biological uh, mental illness with biological problems, then there'll be less stigma associated with those conditions. There'll be just any other medical condition like diabetes, for example. Uh, and there's some truth to this, but when you actually begin to look at the data, it's a lot messier than you would think with regard to stigma. So a couple of meta-analyses, these are large studies, basically studies of studies that look at uh, quantitative studies and then uh, gather together and under specific statistical techniques to look at overall effects of particular um, phenomena. And there's a couple of meta-analyses published by a, a, a group of uh, American and Australian researchers about eight or 10 years ago that actually gathered together studies that looked at what they called biogenetic explanations for mental illness. And that's what it sounds like, the idea that mental illnesses are biologically caused. They're problems of the body, of biology, and not of other things. And they wanted to know, what's the effect of biogenetic explanations on stigma? And in these two meta-analyses, they showed that it was what they called a mixed blessing model. On one hand, people who hold biogenetic explanations for mental disorders tend to blame affected persons less for their problems. So that's good. It's good that people experience less stigma and less blame in that way. And, or I should say, but it wasn't all good news because people who held biogenetic explanations, and these are both lay people and clinicians, and also in one of these studies, they looked at data from uh, people with mental illness themselves. Uh, when people held biogenetic explanations, people with mental health problems were considered more dangerous. Uh, people with mental health challenges that held biogenetic explanations actually had more pessimism about recovery. And there was mixed data in these two studies, but one of the studies held that when people held biogenetic explanations, uh, they were more likely to want to, to keep distance from people with mental health challenges. So it's kind of a mixed thing. Uh, a framing uh, mental illness as a biological problem might decrease blame, and that's a good thing, but it might also increase the degree to which people with mental illness are ostracized or perceived as dangerous or have pessimism about their own possibility of recovery. And so it's, this is a pragmatic problem, not a theoretical problem, but it's something to consider. So I want to move then to, uh, in a more broad way, to ways that this way of thinking about mental health, reductionist ways, affect the way that, that mental health care works. And I'm speaking specifically as a psychiatrist. I think that other therapists and other mental health clinicians may be less susceptible to these, uh, these things. But I want to just uh, offer a few things that I see as trends in the forms of mental health care that I know that are, that are problematic. And then, we'll, uh, and we'll think about Christian responses to these. I'm going to show a couple of older pharmaceutical ads, because I think this is a way to help uh, capture how these ideas show up in the way that people understand themselves. And, and this is a quite old ad. This appeared in, the, in a, a medical journal in the late 1960s. Uh, it's, a, it's an ad for, in the US, it's an ad for a, a benzodiazepine that's still with us. Uh, but this is at a time when this kind of medicine was being used uh, heavily for anxiety. Now, you probably aren't able to read the small print in this ad, but I'll read it for you. And, and just, I wonder what you see in this image. Uh, and we'll come back to that in just a minute. But here's the, here's the text. It says, you know this woman. This is, um, this is written to psychiatrists, almost all of whom at this time would have been men. Uh, you know this woman. She's anxious, tense, irritable. She's felt this way for months. Beset by the seemingly insurmountable problems of raising a young family and confined to the home most of the time, her symptoms reflect a sense of inadequacy and isolation. Your reassurance and guidance may have helped some, but not enough. Cirax, this medicine, can, cannot change her environment, of course, but it can help relieve anxiety, tension, agitation, and irritability. The strengthening her ability to cope with day-to-day -day problems, and then, it, and then it goes on. 
And this image is quite interesting because here's a young white woman who is uh, looks like she's in jail. There's these like prison bars here. Um, but it turns out that the bars are actually household utensils, mops and brooms. There's a tricycle in the background. There's an iron right in front of her. And so the image here is of a woman who is uh, feeling anxious and imprisoned by her domestic responsibilities. Now, there's a lot to say about this ad and about what shows up in it, obviously. Um, but I want to say that this is an example of the way that mental health problems are vulnerable to, can be framed as individual and internal problems, when that really shouldn't be the primary focus. The idea here is that uh, the psychiatrist can't change her environment, of course, and therefore needs to focus on modifying her internal experience. But that's the question, is what's happening with her world of relationships? What's happening with her ability to be active and to work outside of the home? What's happening with her relationship with her spouse, if she has one, with her children, with neighbors, with communities, with, with, uh, with her own uh, sense of herself as an adult who's living in the world. What's going on there? Those are the primary questions, not things that are related to specifically her neurochemistry. So this is one, I think, problem. This leads to another problem, which I would consider self-body dualism. Uh, to a different group yesterday, I, I spoke about Rene Descartes, who is uh, in some ways considered the father, father of modern philosophy. He lived from 1596 to 1650. Uh, uh, a lot of people know Descartes as the uh, father also of what we now call substance dualism. So I'm going to speak a little bit philosophically for just a minute. But the idea of substance dualism is that um, the, the mind or the soul, the uh, what Descartes called the rest cogitans, is is the part of us that is mental, that is thinking, is completely separate, different from, a different substance from the body, which Descartes understood as a machine, as space and extension, as physical, as giving rise to what then become our emotions. Um, and this, this uh, splitting is still with us in our culture. You know, in some ways, even though we try not to, you know, think of ourselves as Cartesians, uh, Descartes still with us, but it creates a problem when you begin to think about mental health problems, because where then do these problems reside? Do they reside in the mind or soul, or do they reside in the body? And either way, I think we run into problems, uh, because if you consider mental health problems as just matters of the mind or the soul, then you end up with, like, pretty harmful views on, like, how mental health can be treated. So since I'm speaking in a, to a in, in a context of a Christian, I'll mention that about eight years ago, there was a study that was done by a research arm of the Southern Baptist Convention that a telephone survey that asked a thousand Americans the question, um, several questions, they asked people to agree or disagree. But on the item with Bible study and prayer alone, people with serious mental illness like depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia can overcome mental illness. Ask people to agree or disagree. And among Americans that identified as born again, evangelical or fundamentalist Christians, 48% agreed with that statement, 47% disagreed, and 5% weren't sure. And that is an astounding number to me. Uh, I, and uh, I'll say as a Christian, I, I think that Bible study and prayer can be profoundly helpful. I would encourage Christians to, to uh, engage in these things. I think Christians with mental illness can benefit, but I would never, as a psychiatrist who's a Christian, want things like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and severe forms of depression to be treated with Bible study and prayer alone. Other things, including medications, are often needed. And in the whole sample that included Americans that did not uh, identify as born again evangelical fundamentalist Christians, nearly a, a third answered yes to this question. And I think this is one example of how when we think of mental health prep challenges as being only in the mind, we can end up discounting the way that mental illness shows up in the body. But there's another way of being dualistic as well, of being Cartesian as well. And that's just that's to say that, well, when we think about something like depression, it just is a certain kind of configuration of chemicals. And, uh, and so you see sometimes, like, this is just a, a schematic of the uh, postsynaptic cleft, but you might see uh, schematics where you say depression just is this bodily state of affairs. And that, I think, also splits mind apart from body. It, it leads people to think that my problem is not me at all. It's, it's in my body, and the body can become seen as a kind of enemy to be conquered. And sometimes we do experience our bodies that way. But I want to argue that that isn't where we want to end up. 
Another kind of dualism can show up, and this is the last drug ad that I'll show, in what I might consider self-symptom dualism. Not self-body dualism, but self-symptom dualism. This is, uh, this is a, a, an ad that's meant to tell a story. Uh, we see on the left, uh, we see another young white woman. It's, it's notable that a lot of pharmaceutical ads in the US feature women and especially white women. Uh, and in this case, she's framed. So we're asked to see something. Uh, she's, the picture's taken at an angle. She's kind of looking out of the window. And what we're told to see is, we don't know her name, but we're told to see depression. And underneath, you see these, uh, these statements. My sadness just won't go away. I don't have the energy to go out with friends. My constant worry is affecting my job. And all of these are things that, if for those of us on this call that are experiencing this, I hope you know, you'll find help in treatment. These are things that are, are not good ways to feel, but they're also fairly common. But we're being asked to, there's a frame here. We're being asked to see depression. And then we're being told to see data, which is, you know, this company's uh, very basic synthesis of what they want you to know about the data on this drug. And then we have another image on the right is to see the difference. And it's the same woman here dressed differently. And now she's, uh, she's arm wrestling. She's surrounded by people. Uh, the image is no longer, you know, taken at, a, at, a, at an angle. And the effect of this is to, is to, uh, is to, to help, help us to see like as a result of this particular medication, what starts as depression can be something else. But what this does is it encourages people to see our experience as human beings, how we uh, live and act in the world as these things outside of us as symptoms that then require modification. And this leads to a fourth uh, kind of, of uh, the way that mental health care often works, which I would call technicism, which is the idea that having the named experience and behavior as symptoms, then effective mental health treatment is to provide whatever the intervention is that will reduce those problematic symptoms. This actually is an interesting study, I won't get into this, but on uh, brexanolone for uh, postpartum depression. But uh, just as an example, every uh, psychiatric uh, 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 treatment study will have something like this, where they'll show how an, a treatment group separates from placebo. And the focus is here on that anything that helps to reduce symptoms is an evidence-based treatment. Um, but that means that all of a sudden we're then thinking of our own experience in very technological ways. And of course, what can be technological can also be packaged and bought and sold. And so mental health care is increasingly commodified, especially in the American healthcare system, but I suspect in different ways in the Canadian healthcare system, where um, there's increasingly the focus on what do different interventions cost? What do these technologies cost? Uh, what is units of a clinician's time cost? And who are the uh, clinicians who are able to see uh, particular people for particular conditions? And so it, it creates a system in which we think of mental health problems as individual problems, unwanted experience in the behavior that are framed as symptoms that demand techniques and technologies that can be commodified. Now that's not all bad, but that's where we find ourselves. And it can lead to a very what a, 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 a way of thinking about mental health that can be kind of dehumanizing. So what might uh, a Christian alternative offer? Uh, if everything I've said so far is based on a basic image that I think we actually get from Descartes of the human body and the human mind as a kind of machine that needs to be fixed, uh, what might be an alternative image for the human that we might find in Christian thought and practice? And I want to offer that the alternative image is that of a wayfarer, of one who is on a journey. And I'll get to this in just a minute. But now I want to switch uh, into like a full, uh, uh, trying, to, trying to give like a specifically Christian account of being human that I think also can apply outside of a specifically Christian context. But I am speaking here as a, 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 the a theological ethicist and theologian, and specifically from a Christian context. The first thing that I would say as a Christian about being human is that before all else, uh, we are deeply and fully known and loved by God. The 139th Psalm, uh, which uh, many of you I'm sure know, O oh Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. 
Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Uh, and so this, this idea that, that we are deeply known, we're deeply loved by God. And I, I love the way that the Catholic philosopher Joseph Pieper uh, meditates on uh, the Genesis uh, 131, where, uh, which says that God saw all that God had made and behold, it was very good. Uh, Pieper says, What's, what does that mean? How does God look at God's creation? And Pieper says uh, that in this case, love, this kind of love, this, this, this statement that, uh, that the creation is good is much the same as approval. Not for approval that of everything in creation, but approval for the basic fact of the creature. And he says uh, that for God to look at us, to look at creation, is to say, it's good that you exist. It's good that you're in this world. And that I think is a, a statement that we sometimes need to hear, I need to hear, and that we need to say to each other, that it's good that you exist. It's good that you're in this world. So Christian faith sees the human not primarily as just a kind of organism out there, but as one who is already, as a basic condition and fact of our existence, beloved of God. And sometimes even outside of a specifically Christian context, I'll say to my own patients as a psychiatrist, it's good that you're here. I'm glad that you're here on this earth. You're a person of great dignity and of great worth. Second, we are living creatures of earth. Uh, Genesis 2 says that the Lord God formed the human from the dust of the ground, breathed into uh, his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam, the man, became a living being. Uh, and I love this idea that, 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 that we are dust, we're living creatures of earth. Uh, and that means, I think, that Christians can wholeheartedly embrace work in the biology of mental disorders. We are dust, we're biological creatures. And we're living creatures of earth who grow and who love in relationship. We're not just dust, but we're dust informed by the breath of God who live and learn and grow in relationship with God and each other, and who in the course of our lives, especially in our childhood, but over the course of our lives, develop ourselves, learn who we are, become who we are in and through the relationships that constitute us. So we can never understand anything about an individual human only by looking at that human. It, we have to always look at the relational set of connections in which we are constituted. And this, I think, is a deeply Christian principle as well as a psychological principle. Uh, and so, again, it leads to this idea of inside out and outside in way of thinking about mental health problems. Maybe sometimes the problems are not primarily problems of the dust, of the earth, of the body, but maybe they're primarily problems of community and of relationships and of how our culture is operating right now. We have to look outside of ourselves. Or to use more of a psychiatric word, we need to think about mental health in biosocial context. That mental health challenges are never only biological or only social, but always show up at the intersection of biology and culture, biology and relationship, biology and others. The third basic affirmation is that we are wayfarers. Uh, the image of the human as a pilgrim is uh, shows up throughout scripture and certainly throughout subsequent Christian tradition. Uh, Hebrews 12, let us run with perseverance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the archegos, the, 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 the trailblazer, the one who goes before us. Uh, and, and so this idea of the human as a traveler, as a wayfarer, is, uh, is built deeply into Christian understanding of what it means to be human. And I think it's a really helpful way to think about how we walk alongside each other in mental health challenges also, because it leads to a very practical question that if we understand ourselves or if people understand themselves as those on a journey, as God's good creatures who are from God, who are on a journey to God, who is not only our creator, but also our end and our goal and our joy, if our life in, uh, as we know it is a journey from God to God, then the question is then what's needed right now for the journey? And I think that this is the most important helpful question that anyone, Christian or not, can ask ourselves in the context of mental health challenges. 
first of all, what, what does the journey look like? Where's somebody going? And then what's needed right now for the journey? Because that answer actually might uh, be a lot of different things. It might be that what's needed is a psychiatric medication or a course of electroconvulsive therapy or TMS. It might be that what's needed is a structured course of psychotherapy, but it might be that what's needed is a secure place to live. It might be that what's needed is secure access to food. It might be that what's needed is to get out of an abusive relationship. Uh, it might be what's needed is a supportive community. It might need that what's needed is a, a community that can call one into friendship or uh, can uh, invite one into shared meals or other things. There's lots of possible answers to that question. And I think starting with that question, not with what's broken and need to be fixed, but with what's needed right now for the journey can be, I think, a life-giving way to think about the goods of mental health care. And then fourth, uh, I would say that Christians would affirm that we find our deepest fulfillment not in control, but in wonder. And I want to say this carefully as well as a psychiatrist, because control is a really good thing. We often talk about controlling mental health symptoms. We uh, we talk about you know bringing things under control. Our medications are largely focused on control. Uh, control is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And I work a lot with trauma survivors. And for survivors of trauma, control over the over uh, one's body, over one's immediate environment, is really important because the world is, has it at one point, uh, and at least one point, been very uncontrollable. And so control is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But if, if we remain focused on control throughout our lives, control of ourselves or of our bodies, of the bodies, especially of the bodies of others, if control is the highest good of our life, then we get kind of enclosed into that pursuit of control. And especially we give a lot of power to whomever or whatever systems or institutions or people or resources we perceive to have placed us or to maintain us in a position of control. It's one way that Christians have understood idolatry as, as like a, a kind of desire for control and seeking control and, and ultimately uh, giving uh, our devotion to things that are somehow not God or opposed to God. But this, this movement of control, if, if control is our highest good, we're going to be subservient to whatever it is that puts us in a position of control. So understanding that, that Christians find our fulfillment not primarily or, or finally in control, but rather in love and in wonder. What does it mean in our practices of mental health care to maybe start with needing control over unmanageable symptoms, but from there to move toward what does it mean to become deeper and greater lovers of God and of others and of the natural world and of those around us? And, uh, and that's something that's, uh, that's deeply important for us to, to consider. Um, and so uh, when I talk with my theological students, I ask, is your study of theology uh, bringing you more into a place where you're feeling like a desire to control? Or is it helping to focus you as, or is it helping to form you into a deeper lover of God and of others? And I would say the same thing of seeking mental health care. Is our study, is our, our, our engagement with mental health care uh, more and more leading us to, to seek control, or is it opening us into uh, a, a posture of uh, openness to love for God and of others? These are, I think, uh, things that Christians would want to ask. So finally, I want to end with suggesting in a very broad brushstroke, what would it mean to think away from the image of the body as machine toward a whole person model of mental health care? Uh, and I want to offer three themes, but first to say that uh, these there's really two ways of seeing that are involved here. The more reductionist way of thinking about mental health challenges is, is uh, would see mental health problems or mental illness or mental disorders as identity defining problems uh, where your diagnosis is your identity located in the individual caused by dysfunction in the body or brain. And so the focus is then like, how do you just reach in and through technology uh, change the body or brain in whatever way is going to make those symptoms go away. Uh, of course, not, all, not everybody uh, engages mental health care that way, but that's a persistent possibility for the mental health world that we find ourselves in. Or do we understand mental health problems as challenges faced by wayfarers 
who are embodied, relational, loved creatures of earth who are on a journey to guide. This is the, the way that we can think about what, how are we understanding our own and uh, our own mental health challenges and the mental health challenges of all those around us. And so I just to kind of repeat some of what I've said, but to, uh, to end with this and to transition to our conversation, I offer three themes. That a, a non-reductionist form of mental health care uh, informed by Christian context would always want to uh, move from only individual also to relational experience. Again, not just to think about mental health challenges as inside out problems where the problem is in the brain or in the individual and showing up on the outside, but also, or sometimes at least outside in problems where the, pro where the problems start in problems of relationship and community and culture and show up on the inside. And so my encouragement to uh, my own trainees in psychiatry, but also to others is, in a culture that kind of emphasizes, that prioritizes inside out explanations, start with the outside in and ask, if, ask how well the outside in model fits to any given situation. And uh, sometimes that can be really illuminating because if we don't just start with the inside out, assuming that whatever the problem is, it needs to be treated as an individual problem. But if we start with the outside in, that can open up new possibilities for response. It is, it is the case that sometimes the inside out model does fit best where there is, um, you know, someone's had a, 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 an illness or there's something that, uh, that fits the medical model of inside out um, uh, challenges better than others. And so I think uh, schizophrenia would be one example of a mental health challenge that I think there's really good reason to think that it follows a, a pretty clearly medical model of brain changes. But even schizophrenia, for example, is profoundly the experience of schizophrenia, the course of someone with schizophrenia, the flourishing of someone's schizophrenia is not only a matter of uh, the processes that are happening in their brain, but it's also a matter of what's happening in the communities that they live and what kinds of resources they have access to and uh, how uh, the community around them responds to their experience. And so even more um, uh, uh, psychiatric problems that are more friendly, more better fitting for a medical model still need to be seen in both frames. This, uh, I just wanna mention a, a popular book that I've, I find helpful in this way, in part because the writer's uh, just so clear about uh, what's at stake. Uh, the, the book Lost Connections by the British journalist, Johan Hari. Uh, Hari described, uh, writes about himself as someone who experienced depression and was treated in the NHS in Britain for many years, mostly in a very biological way with medications. And he began to ask the question, what if the epidemic of depression and anxiety in our North Atlantic culture, especially North America and Europe, is not because there's increasing rates of brain dysfunction as if you know, there's something happening in people's brains, but what if it's that we live in a culture that no longer meets our basic psychological needs? What if we're experiencing an epidemic of disconnection? And he has different chapters where he writes about uh, disconnection from meaningful work, from other people, from meaningful values, from childhood trauma, from status and respect, from the natural world, from a hopeful or secure future. Um, what if that's the problem? And if, and if, if, if the, the widespread increasing rates of depression and anxiety is more a function of a culture that's disconnected? And this book came out before the COVID pandemic and all of the increasing disconnection that we've all been experiencing in some way since February, March of 2020. And he says, what if then the right response to depression and anxiety, he's, he's very willing to say that sometimes medications can be very helpful, but what if our primary way of thinking about uh, depression and anxiety in our culture would be to think about reconnecting all of these things that have been disconnected? And as a Christian, this is where I think that religious communities, faith communities, the church can be deeply important and constructive and helpful in creating cultures and communities of connection and reconnection of communion rather than fragmentation. Second, I would wanna argue that we should move from duality to unity. Uh, so instead of seeing mental illness as either a problem of the mind or of the body, where we can see our bodies as an enemy, Christians wouldn't want to understand humans as ensouled bodies or embodied souls on a journey to God. We walk through this world as living bodies drawn to God by desire, drawn by God, by God's grace. And what does it mean always then to ask, you know, uh, 
uh, what does it mean not to see ourselves as split apart, but as whole persons in the world? And that then leads to then the third movement, which would be from fixing to attending. What if we were to understand, what if in any given situation, we were not to say like, this is a mental health problem that needs to be fixed, but rather this is someone who's on a journey who needs to be attended. And it helps us to have images that are less industrial and mechanical and more organic and communal. What does it mean to walk with each other in the context of mental health problems and challenges? And how always do we ask what's needed right now for the journey? Thank you very much. I'm really grateful for your time today and I really look forward to the questions that are to follow. Thank you so much, Dr. Kinghorn. That was a, a wonderful a talk and uh, a very inspirational. Uh, we have a number of questions that have been coming in um, that have been coming in through the chat already. So if you don't mind, I'll just launch right into those. I'll read them out to you and to the rest of the audience. Um, first question is, how have Christian communities historically approached mental health and have there been distinctive periods? in that approach? Yeah, great question. That's a very complex question because uh, Christ Christian tradition is 2,000 years old, but I'd say that uh, it's just important for me to acknowledge that sometimes Christians have been very constructive in approaching mental health problems, and sometimes Christians have been very destructive in the way that we have, uh, we collectively have approached mental health. I think on the constructive ends, I think it's important to know that, uh, that the, there have been many innovations in mental health practice that actually have been results of Christians acting faithfully in the world as Christians. So uh, one of the first, if not the first uh, hospitals in the Western world was in Valencia, Spain, where a, a priest named Juan Gilberto Joffre saw a man being beaten on the streets of Valencia. Uh, he uh, stopped the crowd from beating this man who was cognitively impaired. He took the man back to his chapter house and he went to the to the cathedral at Valencia and preached a, a sermon in February 1409 and said, you must not allow this to happen in your city. And so they built a hospital called the Hospital of the Holy Innocence that was uh, that still exists in some form to this day. Um, the Quakers in the late 1700s uh, in England uh, noted that uh, the very urban uh, hospitals that often treated people with mental illness roughly as prisoners, uh, that there would be a better way to embody their own commitments to peace and to uh, openness and to the, uh, the inner light of the spirit. And so they formed rural retreats. One was called the York Retreat, that then became, was, um, was copied in uh, U.S. and Canada, and really uh, began to th think about what does it mean to treat mental people with mental illness, not with restraints, but with like, ex you know, engagement with the natural world and with place of serenity and peace. Um, the Mennonites in, I know Alberta has a significant Mennonite population. Uh, in the U.S., Mennonites were often conscientious objectors in the Second World War and uh, had to work in large state asylums that were not very good places for people to live. And after the Second World War, they uh, founded a number of, uh, of mental health treatment centers that were really, uh, really premised on commitments to nonviolence and to minimal use of restraint. And and they uh, continue to exist in the US and I believe also in Canada to this day. And there's other examples like that. So Christians at our best have actually led the way in mental health innovations. And of course, probably all of us who've had any exposure with Christian uh, life know that Christians can also be stigmatizing, can fall into traps of blaming people for their illness, can say that you're depressed because of a lack of faith, or you're depressed because uh, you're sinful and, uh, and, and can treat people with a lot of stigma. And that can be deeply harmful. And so I think it's a mixed bag, but at our best, I think Christian tradition holds resources to think about like, what does it mean to treat people uh, with the kind of dignity and love that God holds for, uh, for all people? That, that kind of ties into uh, another question of how does the concept of sin intersect with mental health issues, I guess, within the Christian tradition. Yeah. 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 That's a, um, that's also, I love these questions because they're really not easy. So that's also <laughs> a really, really challenging question, but I would, uh, I would say, first of all, that mental illness is not equal to sin. And that's uh, really important to say that someone uh, that, that mental illness is, is not like, you're, you're not depressed or anxious simply because you're sinful and you need to somehow repent, it'll all be better. So, so people who just associate mental illness uh, with sin, I think are way off base. Um, 
I do want to say, I think it's, I think it's also uh, complex though, because sin itself in scripture can show up in many different ways. There's different images that the, the Bible associates with sin. Um, and that leads to different kinds of responses to sin. So we tend to think in our Western Christian context uh, of sin as a kind of transgression that needs forgiveness or repentance. And we think of sin in a kind of legal context that involves guilt. And, and that's where I think a lot of the stigma and shame that we associate with the word sin can come from. But sin can also be understood as a power that can entrap people. And in that case, what's needed is liberation. Uh, sin can be understood as disrupted and fragmented relationships. And what's needed then is reconnection and restoration of relationship. Uh, especially in the Eastern Christian tradition, sin has often been understood as wound and as sickness. And so what's needed then is healing. And so I think if we if we get out of a view, a narrow view of sin is only like just you've done something wrong and you need forgiveness. Um, but rather embrace a kind of, I think, a more holy Christian, holy biblical understanding of sin as in all these different ways as something from which we need uh, liberation, disconnection for which we need reconnection, uh, sickness for which we need healing, then all of a sudden the recognition of sin actually can show that we actually all are in need of grace and healing in each other. And so, and I think that mental illness is not unrelated to disconnection and to those things. Uh, so I don't want to say that mental illness has nothing to do with sin, but I want to reject any sense that uh, any specific episode of mental illness is like just because somebody's sinful. That's way too simplistic. And it's just not good theology either. I just, uh, it's, it's remind me if I just can go off a script from these questions too, is uh, Julian of Norwich's Revelations of Divine Love and how that is, um, uh, how she's uh, trying to grapple with uh, her, even Christians, her, her uh, fellow Christians around her who are very anxious about sin and about condemnation. And uh, it gets back to the point you're raising earlier about, she, she says, that may be the case, she may have sinned, but the, the grounding factor is, is the love that, mm, yes. uh, that, that you have, that God has for you, but also that you have for yourself and for others. So um, I'm wondering if you're if you found that people may have responded to Julian of Norwich in your own uh, experience. Has that come um, across? Uh, is she used uh, in contemporary um, studies uh, associated with mental healing? Oh, Professor Music, I would I would like to hear you give a whole lecture on Julian <laughs> specifically in that way. So I want to I want to tune in next week for that. But I would say yes. I'm not a not a scholar of Julian and uh, can't speak in near the detail that you can. I'd really love to hear you say more. I do have a colleague here at Duke, Amy Laura Hall, who's uh, written about Julian and who uh, thinks about her work a lot. But I would just say my understanding of Julian is that she had this uh, just imagination um, exploding vision of the goodness and love of God. And it, uh, it sustained her, it helped her to see the whole cosmos and all of life in just a radically expansive way that made possible just a, a whole way of thinking about the world. And, and that's, I think, in a, in a culture that encloses us, I think we need more of that kind of vision. And I would just, uh, I would just say, say yes, thank you. And I, I really would love to hear you say more about that. About, well, you you about said that. it brilliantly right there. Thank you so much for that. Um, um, now, there are many questions here, so um, have there been recent developments in specifically Christian theology thinking that have helped you in your vocation? That's a great question. Yeah, I, um, how would I frame that? I think that for me, I, um, I well, I just autobiographically grew up as a, as a um, Protestant, you know, an evangelical Protestant context in the U.S. that was heavily informed by Calvinism, grew up uh, in a Baptist context, and now I'm Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that for me, uh, discovering the work of St. Thomas Aquinas, which is not a new development, but something mm -hmm. that I think is, is increasingly, Protestants are increasingly talking about Aquinas in ways that isn't limited to Catholic um, uh, thought. And that, I think, is, that was really helpful for me to be able to think about um, theology and psychology in a way that also could embrace, I think, the best of the natural sciences and especially scientific psychology. And so I'd be happy to say more about that, but that's one thing that I've found helpful. Um, I also think that um, th this this may not be a kind of, this is, uh, well, this is a different 
register, but uh, when I was going through my psychiatric residency in the mid 2000s, so about 15 years ago, uh, there was very little out there that was written about um, Christians and mental illness. There, there was work in Christian psychology. There was, I could talk about several different movements, especially in the evangelical world around biblical counseling and other things, but, uh, but there was not that much that was written, uh, like that was like uh, detailed theological work on what does it mean to live with depression and, or especially of like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia or dementia, neurocognitive disorders. And just in the last 15 years, there's been an increasing proliferation of really good resources that I'd be happy to recommend a few, but that are, are really thoughtful people, sometimes writing in the form of memoir, like uh, David Finnegan Hosey's Christ on the Psych Ward, uh, sometimes written in more theoretical ways, like several books by John Swinton, who I'd, I'd recommend uh, around his work on mental health problems and especially on dementia, um, that I think have really, there's been a, just an expansion of really thoughtful Christian theological work on mental health and mental illness that I've, I've learned from and have appreciated and hope that I can be in ongoing conversation with. Thank you. Um, uh, here's a question, a um, uh, very difficult question. How can we communicate with relatives who criticize us or ignore us completely because of long held grudges? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that is a difficult question. And it's a question that obviously has a very specific mm -hmm. context. And, and I think that it's, it's hard to, hard to know without that kind of close attention to context and to know like what are what are the grudges and who are the people and mm -hmm. I think I would encourage the questioner uh, I think the best answer I could give would be that sounds like a, a hard situation that has been long in mm -hmm. in its formation and probably will take a long time to uh, to resolve and so the most important thing is to have really good advisors so who who's somebody of with wisdom that is in your circle whether that's a therapist or whether that's a pastor or someone that you trust, someone who's a wise person in your, in your sphere who uh, could just help to provide some reflections and think about what specifically do those, um, do they, how, what have those relationships been like over time and what might be ways to, to respond? Thank you. Uh, here's another one. Thanks for your uh, excellent presentation. Could you comment on the narrative of Jesus's exorcism acts in the New Testament, whether this may have alluded to schizophrenia and the Christian teaching regarding approach to mental health that we could take away from this narrative. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a, these are big, hard questions, and I'm but I'm hap happy to to approach that. Um, I would I have thought some about uh, the way that Jesus heals in the Gospels. I didn't mention this in this talk, but I'm happy to. Uh, talk a little bit about that, and that uh, maybe I'd offer it in, in three frames, but one way to say that broadly when we think about Jesus healing in the Gospels, uh, th it's, it's a more expansive vision of healing than we often think about, than I think about as a physician working in a healthcare system in the United States, uh, and I would, I would characterize them as like three, uh, three movements. So one would be uh, reversal, of disorder and decay. So this would be like the way that we often think about healing in our culture of like something's broken and needs to be fixed. Something's dis something's decayed and put back together or most prominently for Jesus, somebody's died and is brought back to life. So that would be a kind of more, more medical way of thinking about healing and, and Jesus did that. But Jesus healing also frequently involved rescue from hostile and oppressive powers. And, uh, these were most often in the Gospels uh, framed in the language of uh, demons or unclean spirits. Um, but it's important to think about how the spirits functioned in Jesus' day. First of all, nobody would have, it would not have been news to anyone that there were demons and unclean spirits around, that the world of the first century would have assumed that the world was full of spiritual forces that were at work in the world, some of which were uh, on the, uh, were um, participating in the ways of God and some of which were opposed to the ways of God. So that would not have been the thing that was um, particularly controversial. People would have assumed that. Um, but what's notable is that, the, first of all, the, in the New Testament, the unclean spirits typically don't cause what we would now consider psychiatric symptoms. They, they cause like what we now consider more like bodily symptoms, like, you know, paralyses and seizures and things like that. So that's one thing. So in, not to kind of associate uh, the demonic with, with mental illness, but also they had a kind of specific thing. It wasn't typically the powerful 
or the elites that were uh, those who were oppressed by the unclean spirits. They were people that were already on the margins. And unclean spirits typically in the New Testament tend to take people that are already vulnerable and make them even more vulnerable. And so, uh, and so Jesus then, in casting out unclean spirits, it, it reaches to the most vulnerable of the vulnerable, those that are absolutely on the margins, and he declares the power of God over all of the forces that uh, take those who are vulnerable and make them more vulnerable. And he then, and this is the third part of Jesus' healing, restores to relationship and community. So if we think about Jesus' healing as reversal of disorder and decay, rescue from hostile and oppressive powers, restoration of relationship and community, then I think we have a, a kind of more whole biblical way of thinking about uh, Jesus' healing. And so in that sense, you can think about maybe the best known exorcism that Jesus did that is often associated with mental illness, that of Legion or the man that we know by the name of Legion in Mark 5. Uh, this was a man who was um, on the outs he was living in the tombs. Um, Jesus came and asked, what's your name? And of course he said, our name is Legion for we're many, or my name is Legion for we are many. Jesus casts out the demons from the man. They go into the pigs over the sea. The man um, then is found in his community. The scripture says, uh, clothed and in his right mind. He then asked Jesus to follow him. Jesus says, no, I think you should go and go to your own community and tell, tell him what the Lord has done for you. This is a predominantly Gentile area, by the way. Um, it's possible to read this as a man with mental illness who was healed, but I think it's a, it's a more compelling image of this is to see it. This is a man who was um, on the outs, who was ostracized for reasons that we don't fully understand. Jesus cast out the powers that were oppressing him. There's definitely resonance to Roman military power, given that the name said his name was Legion. And he then restores him to community. And so I think it, this is not a specifically tale about mental illness, but it's, it's a tale about how people that are broken are then restored. And by the way, this man, um, the, since the Decapolis where this man lived was a predominantly Gentile area, um, some commentators have pointed out that this man became the first missionary to the Gentiles. Um, this man who was living in the tombs became the one who was the first to preach to the Gentiles about the good news of Jesus. Thank you. Uh, keeping with the big and difficult questions, um, how do you view the relationship of ethics and morality to ongoing mental health? Yeah, these are these are really big questions. Yeah, well, um, it, that is a question that obviously could be interpreted lots of different ways. Um, so um, certainly, I think I mean, on the most basic level, mental health care ought to be done in an ethical way, and, and there needs to be a kind of clear attention to boundaries and power and uh, how power operates. And so I, that may have been what the questioner was, was asking. I think that more broadly, though, I think that, as I said before, when I mentioned the caseness problem, mm -hmm. if you can't ever really make a judgment about whether something is a mental health challenge, or at least is something that, that uh, that warrants treatment without making some kind of an ethical or moral judgment, then I would just say that we have to just accept that on some level, whether we like it or not, uh, mental health treatment or seeking mental health treatment is a fundamentally, ineradicably moral, ethical practice that, you know, it involves lots of scientific data. It can be informed by science, but ultimately we make value decisions about like, how's this person's life going? How's my life going? What should I expect? What am I aiming for? And, and so therefore, I think uh, instead of denying that and pretending that we can get rid of that and just be purely objective and scientific, and this I think applies not just to me, but to anyone else involved in mental health care, I think we should lean more into what are the values that I bring into my practice as a clinician or for someone seeking care, like what kind of values do I need and hope for in someone that I'm seeing and how do they communicate those? And I think the more honest we are about our, the, the commitments that we bring into our work that inform those decisions, the more transparent we can be and the better people are served. But I don't think we can ever get away from the ethical or the moral when it comes to mental health care. And I think my image of the human as a wayfarer is fundamentally a moral image because it has to do with like, what does it mean for someone to be on a journey? Where are they headed? And how can I help them in that path? And, and so ethics and values and morality is all built into that. And I just see that as an 
I, my basic view is that you can't ever get rid of that. So you might as well embrace it and try to be as transparent about it as possible and to do it in a way that's um, respectful and nonviolent and um, and um, honoring of people and people's differences and to do that as best as possible. Thank you. Um, here's a, another question. Have you encountered reluctance among devout believers when it comes to seeking help with their mental health challenges? Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things that I care about the most. I think a lot of Christians, and I found myself in this situation and others do, uh, often um, just, there's just a lot of stigma and a lot of shame and a lot of sense that, that if I um, talk about being vulnerable, if I talk about not feeling like I have it together, if I, if I don't present in a certain way, especially in church, but around other Christians, then I'll be judged. Mm -hmm. And that is stigma. And then people often will um, have the kind of shame that if people really knew about my past or if people really knew about how I was really feeling, I wouldn't belong in this community. And so people can then um, kind of uh, distance themselves from relationships right at a time when it's needed the most. Uh, there's also in the Christian, especially the American Christian world, there's there's um, been stigma against like therapy or against psychology or against psychiatry that has um, various, I think it's maybe a little bit less the case than it used to be, but uh, certainly a lot of Christians believe that you just shouldn't see a secular therapist. If you see anyone, it needs to be just a Christian counselor. And so I think that that's a, a lot of that's out there. Um, and I would just say that um, it that for Christians who are thinking that, who feel like um, I, it's wrong to be vulnerable, it's wrong to struggle. Uh, that's not at all uh, something that I think scripture at its best witnesses to. Mm -hmm. It's not how Christians ought to talk about and, and treat each other. Uh, the church ought to be the space where we can most talk about those places where we're struggling and are vulnerable. And, and so Christian communities have an obligation. And I think, I think churches can do a lot to destigmatize by, for instance, talking about mental illness in public spaces, like having it talked about from the pulpit in, you know, in settings where that where preaching happens, it, uh, giving people an opportunity to talk about their own experiences of living with mental health problems and how they've sought care. Um, very practical things like mental health first aid. Or there's there's a couple of uh, of congregational resources. One of which was produced in Canada at uh, Regent College in Vancouver uh, by Sanctuary Mental Health Collaborative, which is a like a video. Uh, curriculum. This is, this is more, well, you get a, a wide variety of you know, church of congregations who could find this useful, but it's basically like, what does it mean to talk about mental health and to find ways to be able to do that in ways that people aren't alone? And I think when churches and Christians start to talk about mental health problems openly and, you know, start to make it something that's just part of what people know is, is there, because every, every gathering has people who are depressed and anxious and everything else. So when, so given that it's already there, beginning to talk about it, it can help people feel less alone. That leads to less stigma and less shame and more belonging. And that is better for everyone. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, here's a, a question. Um, uh, what have, what have been some of your special moments, successes, insight in your practice journey and your career, I imagine? Yeah. 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 That's, um, that's a great question. I think that uh, I, I think I've, I've learned the hard way sometimes and, you know, what not to do and, and some things that I've learned about. Uh, but I think for me, um, I, I was trained in a pretty traditional, I, was, I did my, my main psychiatric training, my residency here at Duke, and, uh, which is a pretty traditional medical center. I learned uh, psychiatry in a pretty medical paradigm. Uh, and for me, I think uh, one of the things that I think I, I and most um, that this uh, well, this is a theological answer, but it didn't it didn't necessarily start with theology. But it, I'm, I always believe that uh, to work in a certain area means to uh, learn the local history of that place. And so I'm originally from South Carolina, which is right south of North Carolina. I did my medical school in Massachusetts. I came back to the to the South, but Durham has a very specific racial class history that has to do with um, railroads and tobacco manufacturing and later uh, and the history of the U.S. American South and the racial history of the American South. And learning more about that history uh, helped me so much to be able to, when um, 
in, in my practice, African-American patients, especially older African-American patients come to me and with depression and anxiety, it helped me so much to be able to ask questions about their own experience, to know uh, how I could most help them to build alliance and rapport. And so that gets out of the language of symptoms and more into the language of story. So what does it mean to think about people as placed and connected to each other in place? Um, and so I love the fact that there was a land acknowledgement at the first, at, at the beginning of this talk. And, um, and, and it matters for mental health because um, I know that the rate of death by suicide for in First Nations communities and especially in Inuit communities is much higher than in the Canadian population as a whole. And so, so thinking about how local history and place and story intersects with people's experiences is I think one thing. And there's lots of other lessons I could talk about, but that's the first one that comes to mind. That's really helpful. I need to read up on Calgarian history, I think now too. That's a, yeah. a great, great advice. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, well, we do have um, uh, a, a lot more questions, but we are running out of time. And I wanted to mention uh, something that uh, Dr. Kinghorn has kindly offered to um, give some time to connect with the audience uh, on a separate Zoom link after this chat, uh, after this presentation. If you would like to chat with uh, Dr. Kinghorn, um, Zaritza uh, will be uh, putting up a link in the, uh, ch in the uh, chat box uh, for the uh, audience to see if they'd like to uh, have a discussion with Dr. Kinghorn. We could also go into a, um, you, you and a person could go into, um, uh, what is it called, uh, a, a little room and, and, and have a chat um, um, and uh, uh, do that uh, via Zoom. So uh, Zarita has put that on up online and uh, this will, that will follow immediately after this presentation. But I want to read um, one, uh, of the comments here because I think it summarizes uh, the entire audience and, and my feeling that simply to say this was a truly wonderful lecture and to thank you very much for coming uh, to speak to us um, on this extremely important topic and give us so many insights, perspectives. And I think what's perhaps more important is hope uh, how to, mm -hmm. to go forward in, these, in, uh, in this area. So thank you so much, Dr. Kinghorn, uh, for your lecture today. Thank you so much, Dr. Music. And thanks to all of you for, I know life is busy these days and it's the middle of a weekend. And I just am <laughs> so grateful to all of you who are here today. So thank you very much. And anybody who does want to connect afterward, I'd love to join you in the Zoom room in just a few minutes. So thank okay. you. That's great. I'm just going to copy that link myself and uh, see what we can do here. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, audience, again, and thank you, Calgary Public Library as well. Thank you.